I'm speaking on uh, how Ehlers-Danlos syndrome affects digestion, nutrition, bowel function, and gut-related immune function. Um, I was asked to attend the conference related to pain, obviously, and Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Um, I think that even though the, the focus of this talk isn't on pain, uh, I think you'll see some uh, very relevant topics to your experiences with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and it really does uh, stress the multi-system nature of the disorder. Um, I have a lot of slides and I want to stress that this presentation is going to be available through EDNF's website in the slide form and I'm going to make the notes form available that includes the notes with carefully referenced articles which underscore the fact that uh, what I'm talking about is well documented in the literature. So even if I pass through some of the slides very quickly and don't give you a lot of the detail that you want, the presentation will be available online for you to look at in more detail. Dr. Collins, can you speak up? I don't know if somebody... Oh, okay. Sure. I think Hippocrates had a lot to say about many different aspects of medicine and I found a few relevant quotes for my talk. I thought it was interesting that Hippocrates has been credited uh, as being one of the earliest to mention uh, Ehlers-Danlos. Um, some think that his mention of nomadic Scythian warriors and their laxity, their difficulty pulling their arrows back on their bows was a representation of a hypermobile connective tissue disorder such as EDS. I think he was pretty spot on with the gut. Um, why talk about this? Um, there has been a common perception that's pretty well entrenched that even if, if you do even know a little about Ehlers-Danlos syndrome that really it involves hypermobility, musculoskeletal pain, vascular and skin issues. So why would we begin to mention the gut? Um, let me give you the very basic terms that if you took nothing else away from the lecture, really this kind of says it all um, in summary. Um, there are connective tissue abnormalities in EDS and the way they can affect the digestive tract is to make it sluggish or painful, inflamed, and leaky. Another aspect is that autonomic nervous system abnormalities are very common in EDS and these autonomic nervous system problems cause gastrointestinal symptoms. Um, a structurally abnormal or inflamed digestive tract no matter how you get there, uh, it can't absorb nutrients. So poor absorption means malnutrition and all the problems that come with malnutrition. So a structurally abnormal, inflamed, or leaky digestive tract can drive the immune system wild. And this is where we start talking about things like gluten intolerance or celiac disease, autoimmune disorders, mast cell conditions. And these conditions don't have to remain limited to the gut. They can actually be so systemic that you recognize them in other parts of the body. So to underscore, gastrointestinal complications of EDS are common, potentially disabling, underappreciated by clinicians, and they're also very well documented in existing literature. So the next section of this talk is going to skip through some examples in the literature. This one is actually more of a mainstream media example just to underscore um, how potentially disabling um, EDS related gastrointestinal symptoms can be. We hear about the vascular involvement. We hear about rupture. Well, this young lady does not have vascular EDS. She has hypermobile EDS and she hasn't had food orally since 2009. She has had uh, her entire large bowel removed. Her small intestine is not functioning her stomach doesn't function and there was consideration of pursuing um, a five organ transplant but the thought is that she's too frail to, ha to survive that. So she gets all of her nutrition through TPN. Again, this is hypermobile EDS. This is how bad it can get. Um, the documentation in the literature spans at least five decades. This is Dr. Byton writing about gut complications in 1969. In the 1990s, we have um, an article that stresses that these ma manifestations can be the entire length of the gastrointestinal system, the alimentary canal, and that they can ra range from being benign and bothersome to potentially lethal. 
This is 1999, and this is a nod to some of my colleagues, including Dr. Levy, Dr. Frank Amano. It's a program from the American Society for Human Genetics meeting that is stressing multiple factors are probably at play. Um, this includes both the structural abnormalities and the use of medications that may have side effects affecting the gut. Um, mentioning autonomic dysfunction as well, talking about gastroesophageal reflux and irritable bowel syndrome. This is a nod to Rodney. Um, we're talking about a connection between autonomic dysfunction and the non-musculoskeletal symptoms of either Stanlos syndrome. And I've, it's tiny for you to see, but I've put arrows around the bar regarding gastrointestinal symptoms in autonomic dysfunction, stressing that it's about 35, 37% of Ehlers-Danlos or joint hypermobility syndrome patients with gastrointestinal complaints as compared to about, 15, uh, let's see, about 15% of the general population. Back to colleagues, including Claire, um, 2007 genetics meeting, uh, and again, a high prevalence of multiple GI manifestations. It included uh, constipation, irritable bowel, acid reflux, gastroesophageal reflux disease, chronic abdominal pain, and gastroparesis. And again, suggesting, hey, there is a lack of tissue integrity in the gut, the blood vessel involvement in the wall strength, and then altered motility and absorption is causing these problems. Same year, um, again, Claire with Nasley and uh, some of our other colleagues are talking about collagen abnormalities causing lesions in the mucosa, altering tissue integrity, increasing the chance, this is the leaky gut concept, you know, immunogenic peptides and substances are making their way through and wreaking havoc. This is mentioning directly mast cell, um, IgE, T cell type responses and the fact that we are recognizing these in patients with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. This article is suggesting a uh, whether there's a connection between joint hypermobility, and they're not stressing joint hypermobility syndrome, but joint hypermobility um, and whether or not that is more prevalent in populations with um, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. I thought this article was important. Again, Rodney had involvement with this. Um, because what you're doing is looking at it from another direction. Instead of taking the population of joint hypermobility patients and asking them if they have gastrointestinal problems, you're going to a gastrointestinal clinic and asking them if they have joint hypermobility. And we're, what we're finding is a strong correlation. Um, this is a very recent article by Rodney, and I just like the, the, his stress um, on the fact that this is a multi-system disorder, and we're mentioning not just the pain, but the dysautonomia and the gastrointestinal dysmotility. I picked this article for very <laughs> specific purpose related to this talk. This is a, what I count a very well-written review article in the last year, and I particularly like it for his diagram. Um, he explains, and this again will be on the, in, written into the notes for you in case you can't get your hands on the article, how this disorder, if you were to represent it um, graphically, Think of the joint hypermobility as, as central and uh, starting within that dark circle. Um, you really need to understand that the disorder really falls within the entire circle, including uh, each of the disorders that you can see in the lighter area. What I look, when I looked at this diagram, I immediately went, well, this is what our doctors typically see. If they recognize the disorder at all, they really only stress the joint hypermobility part of it, and they really are very eager to tell you that it doesn't really involve anything else. So then I started thinking, well, actually what you get is this, because you might find multiple separate physicians with whom you're involved noticing what they're interested in, but they won't make the connection that it is all under the same disorder, which immediately made me think of this. Anybody not know the fable of the blind men and the elephant? Doctors are going to tend uh, to be focused on their frame of reference. You know, if they're looking at the trunk, they're going to see the trunk. If they're looking at the tail, they're going to see the tail. And unless they come together or they get a larger frame of reference, they're not going to get this disorder. I think we are less like zebras and more like elephants in that regard. Um, in basic terms, um, I think that the, the 
physicians in the audience are pretty clear on what we mean when we talk about nutrition and digestion. I just wanted to make sure that we had this in, in more layman's terms. Nutrition is the whole entire process that you require to get your cells what they need to survive. Digestion is a part of that. So digestion is the part that occurs between one end and the other that breaks down what you take in into small enough molecules that they can be absorbed and used for your nutritional status. Elimination, for the purposes of my talk, I'm considering bowel function to re uh, refer to the elimination portion of what goes on in the gut and specifically elimination of stool, kind of in regards to the experience of constipation or irritable bowel type symptoms. Um, the immunity, we have to protect our body from pathogens, obviously, and our immune system, uh, people think of our blood and our white blood cells circulating around, but you have gut-based immunity, and that's a very important concept. So in order to understand how EDS might affect the physiology going on in the gut, I think we need to at least make sure we're all on the same terms with the basic anatomy. We talk about the gastrointestinal tract, which is really a portion of the larger an anatomic system, the alimentary canal, which stretches from the mouth to the anus. Um, this is a busy slide for those of you further away, and it really is just talking about some of the functions that occur in, in each portion of the alimentary canal. What I want to stress is its anatomic arrangement. It's pretty much a tube made of concentric layers that stretches like a tube from one end to the other. Um, when we're talking about the oral pharynx, that includes the mouth and the pharynx that helps you to get food organized to swallow and send into the tube. When you're referring to the difference between the upper GI and the lower GI, the division happens somewhere in the small intestine. So uh, we include the esophagus, stomach, and the duodenum in the upper GI, and the lower GI includes the jejunum, ileum, large intestine, rectum, and anus. The elementary canal has specialized structures around it, and they all aim to help you with digestion and absorption, um, whether it be things that help you to mechanically break up your food and, con and moisten it and mix it. Um, also, we have flow regulators. The epiglottis keeps the food from going down into your respiratory tract. Um, circular muscles, muscles like sphincters are flow regulators. They can help it from going backwards or help you contain it so that you can eliminate in a discrete fashion when you get a chance to get somewhere to do so. The appendix is a special structure that's an outpouch in the canal. Um, this concept of a tube, uh, there's tissue layers that are fairly consistent throughout most of the canal. And what I want to stress in this picture, I've italicized and bolded the fact that you have these layers. You have the mucosa, the submucosa, muscular layer, and a serosa layer around the gut. And they are filled with connective tissue, immune tissue, and nervous system tissue in order to do their jobs. For those who want to look, there's a detailed picture you can look more closely at if you download the presentation that includes these layers. If this is going to point, how can I? There. We've got the mucosa is the innermost layer. And what this graphic is showing you is a schematic that we're saying this is what these layers look like in the esophagus, the stomach, the small intestine and the large intestine, the innermost layer is very expanded because in the small intestine because the main purpose there is absorption. That's what goes on in the mucosa. Whereas in other segments, the layers look slightly different. In the stomach, this is a very muscular layer because that's where grinding occurs and it has to be a very muscular action. So there's differences along portions of the um, alimentary canal as to how the various layers look. Talking about the immune tissues. Um, I really just, this is a list for people. The gut associated lymphoid tissue is what you're seeing on this arm of this family tree. Um, things that come from the hematopoietic stem cells. This is the T cell and natural killer cell arm and they all uh, form elsewhere and migrate to set up shop and live in the gut to help protect you. We're also talking a little bit about mast cells, and I'm, if I have time to mention just a little bit about eosinophils during this talk. Um, it, it's, many people don't think of their immune system as having a huge amount of immune tissue within their gut. This is a huge concept um, that's important to this discussion. Um, we have an ecosystem within us. Um, it lives within the space of our body, and I threw up a few numbers for you. 100 trillion organisms in this space. 
over a thousand species and that number is growing. When I started writing the talk, I found a reference to 500 species and then I found references to a thousand and over a thousand sp different species, primarily bacteria, but there are other things. This is where we hear, I think you talked about the, the helminthic treatment with the protozoa. Um, there are different kinds of organisms living inside your gut and they have 100, combined, their genome has 150 times as many genes as the genes in our body. Um, 90% of the cells in your body are microbial. When we start talking about some of the newer science where we're manipulating the expression of genes to serve purposes for health in our body, what you have to realize is we have the potential to also harness or affect the way the genes behave in the microbes within our gut, and that has direct effects upon our immune system, our nervous system, and our overall health. Um, I gave a URL that talks about the Human Microbiome Project, which is like the Human Genome Project, but it's for your microbiome. The colon has the most biodense, natural occurring ecosystem that we know of so far. Uh, one paper that I said says 10 to the 10 to 10 to the 12 cells per milliliter. And if you were to take feces and take the fluid and water content out and find the dry mass of feces, 60% of it is bacteria. Bacteria, you know, I said this in a larger audience and I could just see faces cringing, the thought of all this bacteria living inside of them. And I just want to stress that the more that this is studied and the better it is understood is bacteria are your friends. I, I kind of couldn't stop myself from thinking of the concept. There's some sort of like pets inside of you that you need to take good care of. Um, they do things for you. They allow you to extract more energy from your, our current diet than we could otherwise get with our, our digestive processes without them. They ferment your um, complex carbohydrates and provide short chain fatty acids for energies. Without them, you have a significant problem absorbing your fat soluble vitamins. Um, th without them, you don't do a good job, or with a poor combination of bacteria, you do a bad job at absorbing calcium, magnesium, and iron. Okay, calcium and magnesium have a huge part in bone health. Iron has a huge effect on anemia. So two very prevalent problems for people with EDS include osteoporosis and anemia. So this should sort of start to, you should be starting to think of connections in your brain on this. Um, bacteria synthesize vitamins that we need. They metabolize our bile acids and things that, the xenobiotics are things occurring in your gut that really aren't nutritive to you or don't belong there. So they help you to get rid of them. I think you could think of it as toxins. Um, they act, uh, this is a very critical point. Bacteria support and regulate the formation of the barrier, the epithelial layer in your gut and the lymphoid function, the immune system. Without those bacteria in your gut, if you were raised in, raised in a, if you were born and raised in a sterile germ-free environment and had no bacteria in your gut, your gut membrane would not form normally and your immune system would not be educated and taught in what it needs to recognize as foreign or you. If you introduce um, pathogens to the gut uh, of, a, a, let's say, a lab animal that is raised in that manner, they become very ill. They can't decide how to rea react appropriately to those kinds of pathogens or insults. And they also demonstrate food intolerances and all the problems that come with them. Um, it's important to realize too that the bacteria actually affect the production of, because there's nervous tissue in, in the gut, the bacteria can, and microorganisms can affect the production of neurotransmitters. Um, there is a gut, a brain gut enteric microbiota axis recognized in the concept that whatever's going on in your gut really does affect in a physiologic manner, not just a, I don't feel so good and that makes me depressed manner. It actually has a true neurotransmitter effect. More serotonin is product, uh, produced in the enterochromaffin cells of your gut than anywhere else in your body. Um, this is an interesting article, if you can get your hands on it, it's, it's thought by many doctors and researchers that this is such an important thing within the body that you should think of the microbiome within your gut as one of your organs. And it just stresses in the illustration here this idea of the protection func the pre protective functions are things like bacteria competing, the good bacteria compete against the bad bacteria. There's structural functions with the bacteria regulating that. They tighten up the junctions between cells and they regulate things 
Um, I think we heard the, the, the toll-like receptors. Um, they affect toll-like receptors on, in the gut cells. Um, and then just again mentioning the idea of how they help with metabolic functions, absorption and um, synthesis of things that we need. This is a busy picture, but again, this is just a schematic and it, it shows that there is a connection between the brain through the nervous system as well as the endocrine, endocrine system, talking about the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis in how the brain is able to communicate, just like the bacteria are able to make things happen that affect the brain, the brain is also able to modulate that environment, but its signals go both ways. This concept of normal biosis and dysbiosis. Um, normal biosis is this balancing act, and you can't see the tiny wording on the picture, but the, what we have is, oops, where am I going? What you have is the symbionts, the commensals, and pathobionts. Symbionts are things that um, it's mutually beneficial. We feed them, they help us. Um, the commensals are thought of things that are colonizing your gut, and they are benefiting themselves from being in your gut, but they're not really causing any problem or giving you much of a benefit other than maybe they fill a niche that the pathobionts won't fill. And pathobionts, in small quantities, um, they don't do much bad and they're benefiting. What happens is if the pathobionts start to get in uh, sufficiently large quantities to compete against the others, pathogen, uh, pathobionts uh, tend to cause inflammation and an inflamed gut is a leaky gut that allows pathogens to penetrate and then you have this whole cascade of potential problems. Uh, dysbiosis in general leads to nonspecific inflammation and again, we have a less effective barrier. I think that this, the fact that this is becoming a hot topic in medicine and in research in general, we have a 2005 Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine regarding helicobacter, helicobacter pylori and dysbiosis and how that affects the gut. Um, bacterial therapy is a concept including what you can take orally, prebiotics and probiotics, I think of prebiotics as bacteria food. It's, it's something that helps the, the good bacteria or the good bacterial mix thrive. Probiotics is actually taking um, microbes in orally. Your you know, that's why you're seeing Activia and all the commercials about yogurt is having such a, a huge market share now is that it is realized how important probiotics are. Fecal transplant is um, a topic that it's difficult to broach with patients. It's difficult to try to convince a patient uh, let's actually instill some feces into your gastrointestinal tract to improve your uh, microbiome. Um, it's applied nowadays, it's be becoming more and more commonly applied in things like C. difficile colitis that has been resistant to the standard treatments, and they're seeing very, very good response. Okay, this is just a, a, a graphic, just again underscoring the factors involved, what leads to this interruption in the microbe balance, um, things including genetics. You know, this is just, it's the genetic lottery. You may be a person that tends toward, for various reasons, not being able to maintain the healthiest balance of microbes in your gut. These are the controllable factors, the things that you can actually directly influ influence with things like main, uh, having an appropriate diet and minimizing stress-like factors because of that connection between the gut and the brain regarding mood. Um, we're looking at things like how birth occurs and, and our exposure within hospitals and how that alters the kinds of micros you're, you're exposed to. Um, this graphic, I, you know, I didn't really see what they were mentioning about vaccination use in the article itself. What I was more interested in is the concept of antibiotics that Obviously, we use antibiotics and we need to use them when people are having infections that they can't eradicate, but it's collateral damage. You're using an antibiotic to kill a particular bacteria and it has a spectrum that kills other bacteria. And this, you know, we have to think of this as one of the potential triggers for what we see down the line in our patients. They are not really mentioning in this uh, graphic the con just the general concept of any medicine that you use, any supplement that you use, any filler or inactive ingredient in any of those things has the potential to directly affect what's going on in your gut. When those things are out of whack, you start to see increased activity in these potentially uh, disease-causing 
T cells, things like ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, celiac disease, gluten intolerance, immediate and delayed hypersensitivity reactions. Okay, now we're going to move on to the autonomic nervous system, which I'm not going to hit in a ton of detail, other than to emphasize that it's critical in gut function. We have this fight or flight system and this rest and digest system, and they need to be in a balance. There's times when one is king and there's times when the other one is in charge. Um, Claire gave a, a diagram earlier. This is a similar one, stressing what's going on during parasympathetic activity, rest and digest. During this time, we, f relative to digestion, we have things like the stimulation of sal saliva, stimulation of activity of the stomach, inhibition of glu release of glucose, because we're getting a glucose supply. We don't need to send out more from our organs. Um, stimulation of activity within the intestines. Um, compared to when we're in fight or flight mode, we stop salivating, we stop grinding in the stomach, things are at a standstill. We're effectively at a standstill. We're, we're now going to start to rele release glucose, we're going to mobilize that to our skeletal muscle because we might need to flight. Um, we might inhibit the gallbladder. I, I hear a lot of ehlers those patients saying, why does my gallbladder have problems? Why did I have to have my gallbladder out at such a young age? What's going on? Um, inhibiting activity of the intestines. This is a busy slide. I just uh, was particularly fond of being able to explain to people there's a starting point where there are sensors within the body. There's sensors, our somatic sensors that sense touch and different kinds of inputs. There are sensors within your gut that monitor your internal organs. And depending on what's going on in the gut, those signals have to be carried to the brain through the peripheral nervous system and the sensory system. They have to reach the brain for information processing, whether that's conscious or unconscious. Your brain makes sense of the information given to it. It makes decisions and makes things happen by sending the signals out the motor division of the peripheral nervous system, including the somatic portion, which controls things like skeletal muscle so that you can move but also controls what's going on in your organs, depending on whether or not you need to be in fight or flight or rest and digest. And I think each one of us has areas where this is relevant to us. Um, I think Dr. Henderson, you know, he'll recognize that with the things that are compressing the nervous system, it, it affects both the input of those signals and the output of the, the activity, the effectors that are going to happen. If you gave a pop quiz to physicians, um, I, I'm not sure of exactly the numbers, I'm, this is my opinion. I think something like, I don't know, 80 to 90% of them would fail the pop quiz as to how many divisions there are of the ner autonomic nervous system. They all remember the parasympathetic and the sympathetic. Many forget that there is an enteric nervous system that is also part of the autonomic nervous system. It lives within the gut and it can be cut off completely from the rest of the body in terms of a connection to the central nervous system and it makes sure that the gut still functions. If you have a quadriplegic and they're, they actually have a severing of their spinal cord, so all of the inputs that are coming from the gut don't get to the brain, if you put food in their gut, it will get digested and it will move because the enteric nervous system can function autonomously. The nervous system lives in the gut. This, the yellower colors in here are depicted in the layers in the submucosa and in the myenteric plexus. It's just the tangle of nerves that are living within the gut tissue layers. This is a more black and white schematic, and the thing that it's really showing you is in these, these little villi in the, in the mucosal surface, there is receptors that tell you what's going on chemically and mechanically, and some of them just exist within the tissue layers. They don't extend beyond the tissue layers of the gut, but there are other nervous system tissue that is communicating between the gut and the central nervous system. You have to take all of these into account to understand what's going on with digestion and all the processes associated with it. So uh, the enteric nervous system is sometimes referred to as the second brain. This is a popular book that's written by a physician. Um, again, emphasizing we have stored programs in the gut that do things like vomiting or you know, if you're exposed to a food or a toxin that your body wants to expel, you'll vomit from one end and send it out the other end without having to think about it. You may not be aware that it's there, you can't really sense it, but your gut does, and it has stored programs that doesn't have to depend on the brain to call up. There's a brain-gut axis. 
in this schematic that's just, again, stressing these parts of our neuroanatomy, the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system, including the parasympathetic and sympathetic nerves communicating with the enteric nervous system. That all has to be there to make sure everything is working. So keep in mind that if the autonomic nervous system and all of its divisions regulate gut function, well, there are things that can go wrong in the autonomic nervous system. So we have to start thinking, well, how are they going to affect the gut? And there's flavors of autonomic dysfunction that you hear coming up in either Stanlos syndrome, and just to touch on them, um, POTS, uh, its flavor is emphasizing the tachycardia part, the very fast heart rate part. Neurocardiogenic syncope, as I've heard earlier today, was the almost fainting or fainting part. Um, Neurally mediated hypotension is stressing the low blood pressure, regardless of what the heart rate's doing. And then the orthostatic intolerance I think of as the basket of any of those symptoms that's not really definable by a tremendously low blood pressure or a tremendously high heart rate. And you can see combinations of these um, in formal autonomic testing in patients that may actually display one or more of these at varying times. Again, emphasizing, um, again, Rodney sees his name on many of these articles. Um, postural tachycardia syndrome is a very common EDS-associated condition. It's well documented in the literature, and I think we're all familiar with that. So the key point so far is the alimentary canal, it's, it's a connective tissue-rich system. It has immune tissue throughout it. There's this important concept of a microbiome going on within the gut that can affect what goes on within our body, and then we rely upon an autonomic nervous system to tell us when it should be doing what it's doing. Should we be in fight or flight, or should we be in rest or digest? If you think you should be digesting and you eat, but your body is programmed to be in fight or flight, it's not happening right. In order to understand how Ehlers-Danlos can affect the physiologic processes, we need to just understand the basics about those processes. And this is, is less for the doctors that had to pass this all in medical school and more for the rest of the audience. Mechanical and, and chemical digestion are what is occurring here. And we're talking about a catabolic process. We're breaking down food into, uh, ultimately we want to get it into small enough molecules to be able to absorb. We start with mechanical digestion and then we use chemical digestion to change the molecules to get them to the sizes that we need to absorb in the gut. Nutrition is the overall big picture, and we talk about nutritional status, depends upon all of these things. Your diet and food choices and any supplements you use, you know, that's obviously the starting point. You need to digest them and absorb them in order for metabolism to occur. Metabolism, all, all those chemical actions that are going on within the body once all the nutrients have been provided. It's important to realize that we can get nutrients by ways other than eating them. We can absorb them transdermally. We can have them inserted intravenously or by other means that bypass the gut. Um, nutrition is a topic of study in multiple overlapping scientific fields. Nutrients. Um, it's commonly broken down, simplified to say anything that you're going to eat is going to include, I say there's six things listed here as nutrients, carbohydrates, fats, proteins, vitamins, minerals, and water. The seventh thing is everything else. In the everything else is things not needed. Um, macronutrients are not macro because they're big molecules, they're macro because they're needed in large quantities. Micronutrients, same thing, they're not small molecules necessarily. They're just needed in smaller quantities, but they are still essential. So the basics of immune function, um, the physiology going on, is you've got this huge surface area. It may, you know, people are impressed at the length of the gut when we hear of, of the, the measurements of that. The surface area is the size of a football field that you have to defend against things you don't want getting into your body. And the analogous system, you know, the next biggest surface area that you have to defend is the respiratory tract, which is about the size of a tennis court. Um, the mucosa of the gut is just about the same as skin. You need to keep bad things out and let good things in. The immune defenses that you have include the cellular and the chemical immune defenses. Cellular defenses we talked about earlier, the lymphoid tissues, the mast cells, the eosinophils, etc. Chemical defenses can be things like m regulating the pH that's going on or um, we talk about antibodies. Well, some are antibodies secreted by us, but some are even antibodies and chemicals secreted by our microbiome. This is a very busy slide. I just want to stress that the, the, the knowledge base is growing as to the manner in which 
those bacteria living in our gut are actually grooming, educating, and controlling the immune system in the gut. We depend upon them. Um, I'm not going to try to dissect this whole picture. I just wanted to stress the idea of we have, um, oops, we have these organisms that are living in this area affecting the integrity of this tissue structure, dealing with inflammation and the penetration of things getting through that, whether it's an organism getting through or whether it's a, a molecule that's larger than it should be and has immunogenic potential getting through, that it has an effect on the reg upregulation or downregulation of the activity of these immune cells so that you can have a response that is either tolerance, which is a good response for certain things, or you can get overstimulation, which is these overreactions we have. Now, whether that is going to be a T cell overreaction that's going to be immediate or delayed type hypersensitivity, or a mast cell or an eosinophilic reaction like mastocytosis or mast cell activation syndromes, or like an eosinophilic colitis or esophagitis, this is what we're talking about. This microbiome has a, a big role in this, as well as. If you're already a person that has an abnormality in your structure and your microbiome has to work even harder to help you shore that up, you can imagine that it's a logical, plausible um, area for potential research to say Ehlers-Danlos patients have a, a leaky gut to begin with and then it's made even worse by what's going on with this other portion of the body. So our modifiable factors, again, the diet, well, depend you are what you eat. If you eat bad stuff, bad things can happen. Um, and then you can also, you have to be kind to feeding your gut biome. Um, exercise has been proven to contribute to certain disease states. Um, if you're inactive, you're going to have a higher risk of problems like gallbladder disease, constipation, diverticulitis, even potentially inflammatory bowel disease. And medications have a huge role. What we are, we have to take to deal with certain things and what we choose to take non-prescription medicines, nutraceuticals, supplements, herbs, teas, and um, as Dr. Chopra pointed out, you know, you have to take into account, you're taking a pill that has an active ingredient, but along with that pill comes fillers and preservatives and dyes and colors, and all of these things are factors that are affecting all of this. So in very basic terms, EDS can cause problems with how your elementary canal is built, maintained, repaired, and then you've got another system telling you whether it should be in fight or flight or rest or digest. And on top of that, you can do things that can potentially regulate or dysregulate all of the things that are meant to go on to keep you healthy. More specifically, we know EDS is a connective tissue disorder, so we know it affects the gut. Um, the autonomic nervous system, we know there's autonomic problems in EDS. So of course, if the autonomic system affects gastrointestinal symptoms, ding, 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 it's, it's happening. Um, and the modifiable factors, I think it's important to recognize EDS patients, for one reason or another, may have a suboptimal diet, and they certainly find it difficult to exercise. Uh, additionally, there are numerous medications, and, you know, I think we talked a little bit about um, patients becoming desperate after this terrible journey that they have with multiple medical practitioners. It's not just what doctors are prescribing, it's what patients are seeking out, and all of these things affect what's going on. So connective tissue abnormalities in EDS may affect digestive physiology by causing structural issues in the gut, as well as things that you can't see being abnormal within the structure, the functional issues and how things move and are processed. This uh, section of my talk, um, I want to be able to preserve time for the other speakers. So although I have large lists of the sections of the gut that are affected, I really don't want to dwell a lot on each individual condition. Uh, I just want to stress that these structural issues might need to be seen at a tissue level, such as a biopsy or even autopsy, whereas the other issues you might be able to see with imaging or on gross inspection. Um, the functional gastrointestinal disorders are a very specific terminology in which there's no known underlying structural, biochemical, metabolic, or autoimmune cause, and there is a set of officially accepted clinical criteria called the Rome 3 criteria that doctors use in order to identify these people with these functional gut disorders. Starting with the teeth, um, I'm not sure, can everybody see this list? Is that small enough print? Um, I think I asked the audience uh, yesterday, there's a number of people in the audience, how many had actually 
seen any of these problems with their dental health and a lot of hands went up and I think one of the pertinent messages aside from the dental hassles you have is that this actually affects what you're going to choose to eat if you have dental problems and you're going to go after a diet it may not be very rich in, in healthy fibers and good vegetable proteins you may be eating kind of soft processed unhealthy foods the oral pharynx, um, there are a couple things mentioning is, you know, the dry mouth, um, temporomandibular joint dysfunction. Again, I, you know, I have had patients that are really not so much stressing what's going on later on in their gut, but they're just saying, it hurts to eat. My mouth is killing me. Structural issues in the esophagus, the one I wanted to dwell on a little bit is this, the, in, within the gastroesophageal uh, reflux, is this silent reflux. I will ask people if they have reflux or if they know whether or not they have reflux and they immediately say, no, I don't because it never hurts. And this concept that reflux must be something that hurts. Silent reflux can occur without pain and the contents of uh, the gastric juices and the acid reflux can actually get high enough up to affect the pharynx. And you'll see people that will have post-nasal drip. It'll look kind of like a chronic sinus infection. They can get a hoarse voice and a chronic cough that won't clear a lot of phlegm clearing. And I have personally directed patients to go get tested and get seen by a gastrointestinal specialist that come back and say, I have terrible laryngotracheal or laryngopharyngeal reflux. And they were astounded to know that this was part of what's going on for them. I think you'll actually see that some of the patients have been diagnosed with asthma and they're kind of wondering, well, why don't I respond to asthma treatment? Well, this is one of the potential reasons. Um, in the stomach, I think the, one of the key points on this slide I, j I just wanted to stress is that if you find diverticula in the stomach, they don't typically rupture because the stomach has tough enough wall with all the muscle, but it's a sign that something's going on throughout the gastrointestinal tract and you really need to not stop just looking at the stomach you need to look further in other places that are more prone to rupture if there is a diverticula. Um, again, I'm going to stress that anything that's listed in this section of slides about the structural issues in EDS, these are all things that I personally found reference regarding these findings in EDS in the literature. So this is not just hypothesized structural abnormalities. This is documented. Uh, volvulus and visceroptosis are terms that some audience members might not be familiar with. It, think of volvulus as twisting. The organ, um, because of its structural abnormalities, may be more prone to getting twisted up. And if it does, it may choke off its own blood supply. And that's where you get the infarction or the, the death of tissue, which is a problem. Um, visceroptosis is the concept of the anatomic relations to one another, their position in the gut. And visceroptosis is sort of the sinking down that when you look at people, their stomach should be up here but it's kind of down further in the abdomen and how that relates to how things move during digestion and how much pain or discomfort that might cause, what it might displace. There's some thought that visceroptosis of the abdominal organs may relate to um, increased amounts of adhesion, um, which may be part of this connective tissue abnormalities. Uh, small intestine. Um, when we talk about dilation in the small intestine, even the older text that I looked at, the gastrointestinal text, um, that had maybe a paragraph about Ehlers-Danlos, the one thing they mentioned was this small intestine dilation with bacterial overgrowth and malabsorption. So there's some connection there that in the course of these abnormalities, you do get enlargement and dilation of the small bowel. And that's a sign when you see that in somebody, they are subject to malabsorption. And again, we had the volvulus and the visceroptosis. Um, perforation. Um, I'm not going to stress this so much here. This is um, a big problem for vascular EDSers, not just that perforation can occur, but their difficulties in healing. They are not very likely to be able to be treated just with antibiotics that can protect them from the infectious processes. They very often need resection of a part of their bowel. Um, it, even the liver, gallbladder, and pancreas are subject to things like rupture, mainly because of the connective tissue and the capsules around them or within the walls of the ducts. And as I said yesterday, the one bonus may be that we get less appendicitis. The appendix is more able to stretch, is a little bit more giving before it would rupture. The large intestine, similar issues to the small intestine. Um, I had a couple of people come up to me and explain that they had been diagnosed with dolicocolon. Their surgeons were astounded at the length and the dilated status of their colon. 
And I look at it this way, what's going on in the colon is reabsorption of water. And if you have a very long length of colon and you're doing a lot of reabsorption of water, you're going to be trying to pass cement blocks and they're not going to go anywhere. So we've had patients that had to have partial bowel resections just for the size and to help them with their constipation issues. This is um, a pretty busy slide. It's, it's really, again, stressing for vascular EDS patients, especially um, sort of the harbingers of perforation and the, and the fact that perforation tends to be a recurrent thing. So we, we're talking about col you know, colostomy, eventually colectomy, and even the concept of a sort of a prophylactic um, colectomy for what would be considered, a, hey, I'm looking at that and it's inevitably going to perforate. And when it perforates, if you're a vascular patient and you have trouble with bleeding, I mean, it's potentially lethal. So we're gonna go ahead and give you a colostomy. That is something very real for some of these patients. Um, we talked about the rectum, uh, risk of traumatic perforation is especially more common in VEDS. Um, the avoidance of colonoscopy, I thank Howard Levy for pointing out to me yesterday. Um, mo uh, many EDSers are aware of the relative contraindication against um, a colonoscopy. Sort of a, if you really need it, you need to consider getting it. If you really don't need it, if you're not considered at high risk, it may be you know, ideal to avoid it. But as Howard pointed out, the alternative imaging um, involves instilling air, kind of blowing air into this space. And what he's pointing out is if you have a very astute um, provider of colonoscopy, they're taking into account how gentle they have to be with your tissues. But if you don't have a very astute uh, interventional radiologist or radiologist, somebody, whoever does this study, and they're not very careful with instilling the air, that can be equally traumatic. So you have to weigh all those things for somebody that's considering colonoscopy and maybe at risk of, of bowel issues. Gastroparesis is incredibly prominent in EDS. Um, I'm not sure how accurate the numbers are in the literature, but I think it's pretty safe to say it's a very common problem. And in the general population, we talk about gastroparesis, and already within the general population, about two-thirds of the cases, we actually have a known cause, like an autonomic neuropathy and diabetes, um, other kinds of autonomic disorders that we see in things like Parkinson's disease. After patients have had anorexia or bulimia, um, they end up getting this poor gastric emptying. But I think what we're talking about in EDS is when we don't have any of those other known factors, we fall into this other third of cases that are idiopathic gastroparesis. Nobody can figure out why you have it, but we're acknowledging EDSers have it. And that delayed emptying is an example of dysmotility. Things don't move through as fast as they should. This doesn't just occur with the stomach and its delay in emptying its contents. Things can back up in your esophagus. You can have undigested food that hasn't even reached your stomach that is not moving through because of ineffective swallow and dysmotility in the esophagus. Um, we talked about gastroparesis. There's dysmotility in the small bowel. If food is sitting in the small bowel where bacteria are working on digesting it and they have metabolic processes that lead to bloating and distension, you, know, you can see how Things have to move along the conveyor belt at the healthy pace that we expect, otherwise secondary problems begin to occur. The functional gastrointestinal disorders are very easy to find the Rome 3 criteria and see what doctors use to categorize you according to this criteria. What it really is, is you've gone through this huge workup to find out why you have this symptom, and the doctor sits down and says, look, I can't find anything on your x-ray, your endoscopy, your colonoscopy, your lab work, every test that I've done. I can't see anything wrong, but we're acknowledging you have this disorder. You have abdominal pain. You have diarrhea. You have constipation. You have an irritable bowel. It, it's at least a recognition of this as a functional disorder being diagnosed on clinical criteria without demonstrated abnormality. And again, this list is not the entire list of functional gastrointestinal disorders, but I found in literature specific reference of these things being prevalent in EDS. So this is an article, um, tiny print again, but I just want to stress gastrointestinal symptoms are associated with orthostatic intolerance. So he is listing in the bars on this side of the graph. Um, I, unfortunately, he doesn't have a nice graphic comparing those bars like in Rodney's that compares them to the general population, but it just does tell you that 70 plus percent of people with orthostatic intolerance have abdominal pain, 50 plus percent have nausea, 
50 vomiting. We get into the tw over 20% with diarrhea and weight loss, and then a percentage a little bit lower, decreased appetite, gastroesophageal reflux, constipation, blood in stool, and uh, vomiting blood. I mean, this is no small effect that when your autonomic system is telling you you shouldn't be in rest and digest, and instead you should be in fight or flight, these are some of the potential things that are happening. Nutrition. Um, I, I, this is careful wording on this slide, and I don't know if people pick up on this, but instead of saying the literature documents EDS patients have nutritional deficiencies, it's we recognize it, we listen to our patients, we know in our patients whether the literature tells us or not, they have nutritional deficiencies, and many of them are very compliant, they eat well, they take their supplements, and they still can't get these deficiencies addressed. Formal research is lacking, we need more research. The most likely culprit is again, these connective tissue abnormalities with inflammation, dysautonomia, a gut that can't absorb. We recognize things like calcium, magnesium, potassium, vitamins, and the associated conditions, osteopenia, osteoporosis, anemia. You know, we know these things are happening in EDS and people are walking around going, why are they happening? Well, it's tremendous malnutrition, I think is part of it. Um, maybe not for everybody, but I do think it has a big role. Um, one thing that's important to mention, some of these deficiencies are not showing up as abnormalities on labs because we check blood and some of the deficiencies are not reflected in blood. Magnesium is a huge deficiency and it has huge impact, including nervous system abnormalities, musculoskeletal problems. Um, magnesium is, it attenuates the sympathetic nervous system response. It's a natural alpha blocker. So if you are deficient in magnesium, you're going to see some big symptomatology, and this is widely acknowledged within EDS. My points I wanted to stress is these repletion of deficiencies, you can't expect that it's going to turn around in a day. Some of these patients, you may, may not have realized they were deficient during their youth, growing up, development, the impact of malabsorption and malnutrition, you can't just turn around when you start to take your supplements orally, you get patients that, that take it for a couple of days and they go, I didn't feel any difference, so I stopped taking it. It may take years, I mean, bottom line. Um, and sometimes it may not fully reverse conditions that are depended upon nutrition at a key portion of your development. And in my mind, that makes me think of the, this potential vitamin D connection and the fact, you know, people are recognized is multiple sclerosis more common. Well, just in the general population, if you were not getting your vitamin D at a crucial part of your neurologic development, you're at a higher risk of multiple sclerosis is one of the theories. Well, I think that might apply in EDS just from the malnutrition aspect, not from a particular molecular basis of EDS. There's national guidelines established for nutrition. We have no idea how they should be modified for EDS patients. We need more research. This comes from an old article I just flung it up here because I want to stress this is in a journal called Medical Hypothesis. This is a hypothetical nutritional regimen for EDS based solely on the fact that we see these associated conditions and they're known to do okay with some supplementation of some of these or, um, vitamins and minerals. Um, we don't have a clear, controlled, properly structured study to show how we should modify nutrition and how we should supplement people with EDS. We need one or more. Until we do have that research, we just need to apply the existing standards for the underlying problems, malabsorption, structural or functional issues, dysautonomia. We need to treat those things in order to try to get the other things better. This is a single slide, and I, in the interest of time, I'm just going to stress, do not go buy collagen supplements and think that they are going to fix your problems. Your body will digest them, it will make them in tiny little building blocks of collagen, and it will not reassemble them, them appropriately where they need to be. It's just a fact. So are persons with EDS more prone to food allergies and hypersensitivity, inflammatory or autoimmune disorders? Well, available medical knowledge is making these connections, and I'm crediting patient experience. We're listening to our patients. You guys were saying it a couple years ago, and now we're, it's entering the sort of medical discussion. Um, but formal research is not clear for us. Again, the most likely culprit is going to be these intrinsic connective tissue abnormalities with dysbiosis, dysautonomia, and a leaky gut. This is an article that Claire was part of, and I kind of blew up what it's saying. Again, it's stressing lesions, altered tissue integrity. You're getting larger proteins crossing this and creating an immunogenic response. 
You're talking about mast cells, IgE, T cells, interleukins, eotaxins. This is a big issue and it, it bears more research. Last year, 2012, what we were looking at is instead of looking at rheumatologists and people interested in EDS, we're talking about just people looking at allergy and immunology, recognizing gastrointestinal food allergies in children with Ehlers-Danlos type 3 syndrome, that they commonly have multiple food allergies, eosinophilic colitis, um, and they often require enteral and even parenteral, meaning IV or TPN nutritional support in order to maintain their health. Um, we have other colleagues talking about eosinophilic esophagitis, that it's shown to be at a higher incidence in patients with inherited connective tissue disorders. Roddy pointed out very nicely in his article last year that there's only two articles that really address this question of whether joint hypermobility or joint hypermobility syndrome has a correlation between inflammatory bowel disease, such as ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, or celiac disease. And he really says very eloquently, neither of these studies are, are well enough designed for us to really rely upon them as a strong connection. Um, I think the, the Greek one was uh, um, stressing joint hypermobility, Crohn's, and ulcerative colitis was really looking at a population on, with joint hypermobility, not joint hypermobility syndrome. And the other one was a very highly selected uh, patient population that probably had a, a selection bias affecting its statistics. So until research is available, we still need to do what we can according to known standards. I want to just very quickly cover two topics as quickly as I can. Gluten sensitivity. Um, it's a protein that is very pre prevalent in a Western diet. And the two conditions I wanted to talk about is celiac disease and gluten, in, uh, gluten sensitivity or gluten intolerance. Those two disorders are not the same disorder. And it's very important when patients talk about having celiac disease that very often they're actually talking about having gluten sensitivity. Either way, they should avoid gluten. Celiac disease is technically an autoimmune disorder. You are making antibodies to antitransglutamin, or it's an antitransglutaminase antibody. And there is a correlation between particular HLA types. And in addition to the autoimmune problem to the transglutaminase, you're also seeing people having additional autoimmune problems manifest in their body, such as autoimmune thyroiditis. Um, it's known that this disorder involves leaky intestinal mucosa, and it's a combination of the cytotoxic effect of the gluten, a portion of the gluten molecule, as well as this innate autoimmune triggering response from another part of the molecule. It causes multiple GI complaints, and I think one of the things I wanted to stress is when you look at this list of things at the bottom, it looks awfully suspiciously similar to what many people with EDS present with. That is not saying that I think celiac disease and EDS are the same thing. It's, I think what it's more saying is both of these things involve malabsorption. And malabsorption causes secondary conditions, and those are among the secondary conditions. Gluten sensitivity is like celiac disease light. It's not the autoimmune disorder, it's the inflammatory disorder. Again, causes a leaky bowel and is accompanied by similar symptomatologies. An article that I wanted to stress is, is talking about the fact of this, how can we affect the genetics? Um, depending on what you eat, you may be able to protect your gut from the inflammatory response that's going on when you're exposed to things like gluten. There's a nice diagram in the article, if anybody wants to dig further, that really divides this cytotoxic side, the problem coming from this po yellow portion of the gluten protein that is causing cytotoxic damage through oxidative stress and making this a very leaky, inflamed gut wall. This response is present in everybody. And this is sort of the concept where everybody's saying, you shouldn't eat the Western diet that is very high in these kinds of, you know, the wheat and the rye and the barley, because everybody to some degree suffers oxidative stress when they're trying to digest this portion of, of that gluten molecule. The other side is the concept that depending on who you are, depending potentially on your genetics and the combination of things going on in your gut, this other part of the molecule is actually causing an immunogenic response that is a maladaptive immune response in celiac disease. It's causing your immune system to, to trigger an autoimmune problem. And the authors were stressing this idea that there is in vitro evidence that certain nutrients in vitro have been shown to actually protect against the gluten-related cytotoxicity. 
And they are proposing in their article that further research is needed regarding whether these kinds of things in foods are going to protect against cytotoxicity and therefore help with all of those things that come with the gluten sensitive enteropathies. And I think that when we think of it for what's the potential within the EDS related research is, you know, would this apply to EDSers who have maybe not cytotoxic by the same mechanism, but a leaky gut because of our structural abnormalities on a microscopic scale. This is um, the mention of mast cell. A few years ago, mast cell was on a lot of lips because it was recognized to seem to have this link in some of the postural tachycardia syndrome presentations. Um, regardless of what the link is, I just want to show you two slides or three slides on mast cell. This is the basics of how mast cells function. Mast cell activation is a normal process. It's part of our defense against certain um, exposures. The good example of, of an exposure we want to be defended against is insect venom. This is how our body responds. Mast cell activation disorders include sort of a pathologic level of response, either overreaction to a valid trigger or reaction without any valid trigger is how I think of mast cell activation problems. And the signs of mast cell activation include these things I've listed with, I put in bold and italics, the ones that are sort of the most pathognomonic, the most commonly seen ones in the mast cell disorders. So it's, it's, it's a flushing disorder is the way it's usually thought of. And then we have these poor memory that we're talking about brain fog, headaches, abdominal pain, diarrhea. So this is a very busy slide, but this, if you can follow me on this one. The predominant thinking up until very recently was that we needed to demonstrate, doctors love tests. So doctors were not going to treat you or call you somebody with a mast cell disorder unless they found lab abnormalities. That's what this box is, is you're supposed to measure mast cell mediators in your blood during an event. If they're elevated here, you got a trial of a drug that was either a mast cell stabilizer or a mediator blocker. And if you responded to that drug, you got called somebody with a mast cell activation disorder. So everybody else that had these levels tested, if they were normal, they said, nope, we're going to stop there. We're not thinking of mast cell in you. You don't have it. And uh, this is what I see in patients. There's so many patients out there with EDS saying, well, I know I have mast cell, but my doctor tested me, my labs are normal. They will not admit that I have mast cell disorder and they're not giving me anything to, ta to make to take care of it, so I just take Benadryl, or I take Zyrtec, or I take whatever. But I very, just a couple of days ago found this lovely algorithm that talks about <coughs> you test, but you don't care whether the levels are elevated or not. You give a trial of medication in either arm. People who have elevated, obviously elevated levels of mast cell derived mediators they are considered to have non-clonal uh, mast cell activation syndrome when they show a good response to a mast cell stabilizer or a mediator blocker. The others um, are still acknowledged to potentially have a mast cell disorder. We're giving them more validation as to the existence of their problem. That's the key point I wanted to make about mast cell disorders because it's such a complex issue. It's sort of as complex as Ehlers-Danlos is. Um, is. There's a lot more that could be said about it. I just think this is so critically important because I'm listening to patients saying, how can I convince my doctor that I need a trial of this medication? They're not believing me because my labs aren't abnormal. I think this is a very valuable um, algorithm. So the rest of this is just in summary. So I'm gonna kind of fly by. Um, we need more research. We don't have a well-established uh, connection, but I think we need to acknowledge this. And I think you can base clinical recommendations on what we're saying. We need to address the structural abnormalities. We need to consider the risks and what to do about them. We need to strive to con uh, control the dysautonomic symptoms in order to get good results. We need to determine what the nutritional deficiencies are, and we need to be willing to consider that it's not just as simple as telling somebody to eat well or take a vitamin. You may need to, to um, replenish them parenterally, IV, transdermal, whatever you need to do. Um, I'm not going to dwell on the recommendations for how to maintain a healthy gut biome because there's not a universal agreement on them, but there's a lot of ideas about um, pre prebiotics, probiotics, antioxidants, fiber, vitamin D, um, omega uh, fatty acids, and then how to structure your diet with primarily vegetable protein rather than animal protein, the kinds of fats, the kinds of carbohydrates you should eat, but I think this is going to be an expanding field. 
Uh, it is reasonable to advise people with EDS who think they are gluten intolerant to stop eating gluten. I don't think that would hurt any of us. Uh, it is reasonable to offer a trial of mast cell mediators to people despite the lack of lab abnormalities based on their clinical presentation. And these are the typically uh, used blocking agents. Here's my rock in a hard place. <laughs> we know all this and then we still have problems deciding what to do. How many times have you seen somebody that, well, we know you're anemic, we know your iron is low, but you're constipated. Giving you iron worsens the problem. You know, we know that you have dysautonomia, we'd like you to take a beta blocker, but it's going to really bring on your symptoms of your mast cell problems. This is the challenges that I think we as the doctors involved and the people trying to sort out this big puzzle, we are between that rock and a hard place right now and we need more research to help us get out. <laughs> mm -hmm.